thank you. Perfect. So let's get started. We'll pick things up exactly where we left them. So we just talked about how we can go from six months or three months releases to three weeks. And I'll tell you how you can get down to 30 minutes. Or at least this is what I aim for. I usually get to one hour release cycles with my teams. A quick introduction. Many people know ThoughtWorks, not all, always do. Um, we are consultancy. We work on service design, software development, delivery assurance, digital strategy, all of this around technology in general. We like to publish open source software. You may know Selenium, which is a totally independent project on its own. You may know Delivery Pipeline Go, that is a product that we sell even, and all kind of other stuff. We write some books, um, like Continuous Delivery, Building Microservices, Infrastructure as Code, and we try to publish many, many, many inside articles about what we do. And soon, upcoming is our technology radar, where we give an insight on what technologies we use, which one we think are worthwhile, and which one we think you may want to drop or try. But anyway, I don't want to talk about my company, I want to talk about how we work, and how we are building high quality products. I'm, I'm taking a different perspective than the talk before, but I talk about the same topic, right, from a quality perspective. And what is quality for me? I used to talk about this product. Don't judge me, I baked it myself, uh, just for the slides here. So it's not a highly professional photo. Um, this is a product that you all know, and you could say quality here is the size, for example, or the color, or the picture that I like to talk about is the chocolate chunk on tops, right? This is a really good quality muffin. And this is just like we develop software. We build the product, and then we test and put some quality on the outside afterwards. The problem is that the muffin looks like this. If you slice it open, there is no chocolate inside. And why is that? Because testing does not improve quality. If you take this picture, the dragon testing the car, the car won't improve. Maybe the car will fail. Maybe the car will melt. There can happen so many things to the car, but it won't improve in quality. The same for our software. If I have a system under test, if I set the system up properly, by definition it doesn't change. Who wants to test an ever-changing software system? No one. You try to isolate it, and then you test it. But that doesn't improve quality. So what do we do? I want to propose some solutions, but before we go into nitty details, let's look at the overall problem a bit more. So this is where I usually live, or where testers live. Uh, this is the process. I get some new build, I get some freshly baked software. It's coming to the test server, I'm doing some smoke tests, and then there's some elaborate test suite running. It can be manual, exploratory, it can be automated, I don't care, some kind of test suite. I somehow do a bit of monitoring and say, hey, I'm going to go live, I deploy the thing, and then I maybe have some live tests. And all of this process is part of just a bigger process, and it's at the very end, right? And I hope that all of you are somehow familiar with these pictures of going from an analysis state to a development state, QA, ops, done. The problem now with this testing is, if I find something, if I find an issue, it goes all the way back to the beginning, and we have to prioritize this issue against all the other things that we want to do. And that's a very long long time going forward, which is basically our time to market for new features and our time to fix for bugs that we have. So I want to reduce this. And we've just seen how the entire ops operations is moving in this dev space. So I won't get into details here. I think you're all familiar with it, and a lot of core talks are covering it. Let's, let's take this as an assumption and a set going forward. So what else can we do to improve our time to market? What can we do to not have to eat this muffin, but rather the one where the quality is baked in? You most certainly have to get involved way earlier in the baking process, in the software development process. And we identified four areas where we work as, as QAs or quality specialists in ThoughtWorks Germany. So the talk will go over these four th sections. I'll talk a bit about processes that we apply, processes that we change, and how changes and processes help us to deliver faster. I'll come to the engineering aspects, and I'll think, I'll cover many of the things that we heard. I'm gonna repeat them, because this is how propaganda works. No matter if it's true or right, as long as you repeat a message to the human brain, 
the human brain will think it's true. So I'm going to do this today. We'll talk a bit about business because that is, I think, what differentiates the, the QA perspective a bit from the ops perspective. We are looking a bit more in the business uh, part and see if we actually ship value. We've seen this before as well. And we'll talk about the team and how working with the team um, actually improves the quality of your product. First step, the process. We've just had a first glimpse at it. We have stories or tickets or tech tasks or bugs somewhere in an analysis lane. We pile them up. We plan to deliver value, basically. In the next column, which is very often a sprint backlog, the stories lie around, and we are basically wasting time. So if I, if I have a three-week sprint, like in the example before, the story that is lying there, the last story that I pick is maybe lying around for two weeks, and nothing happened to this story. In the best case, in the very best case, it's still up to date, but that's the best case. So then someone picks it up, and we actually start adding value to the software that we have. Then usually, we are throwing it into another parking lane, waiting for some QA team or a QA to pick this up and test this, which is, again, just wasting time. The software is lying there. The value is there. We, we, we just don't ship it because of some processes and handover between the people inside one team. So finally, we check for the value, and then at some point, we deliver this value. And then we say done, and we take the next piece. So the first thing that we want to do, usually, is to get rid of the two wasting columns. The one between analysis and dev is a bit more complicated, and we never totally get rid of it. We usually try to park two or three stories there that are always ready to go but never stories that just hang there for two or three weeks. The other one is fairly simple. It's my column. If I come in in my role, I just take it off and say, that's my role, that's my column, I don't need it. That's an easier argument to make. And we do something else. We add so-called work-in-progress limits that you maybe know from the Kanban system. Anybody familiar with work-in-progress limits? I see a raise of hand. Some. Okay, then I'll explain a bit more. The idea is, that you limit the amount of work that you currently do. That means in, in my team right now, where I'm on right now, the project I'm on, we don't have more than three tickets in play at the same time. No matter if it's stories, bugs, tech depth that we play, just three things, nothing more with a team of six developers. What's the benefit? If you, if you especially if you get rid of the parking lanes and you just pull in tickets as they are finished, you land with something like this on your wall, right? Too many things on the wall. Nothing really moves forward. What you want is flow. You want things to move along. They may move slower, but as soon as you have some issues, it's not a major problem, right? Because all the things can still move along. In another way, you focus on fewer things to achieve more. It's a bit counterintuitive. So I brought some facts. One of the projects I was on, one of the teams that I visited, um, was at Metro, which is a whole thing. Who knows Metro before I talk about Metro all the time? OK, I don't need to talk about Metro. Excellent. Um, so this is our cycle time, the amount of days a story needed until it got done. And we started somewhere around five days, and then we got worse and worse and worse until we were somewhere around 12 days that we needed to finish the story. And here it's almost 15. 15 days. One of these data points is one single story. And then you can some see some moving average here. And after a few months, when this, this is, I mean, way too slow, three weeks for one story, that, that, that couldn't be right. So we implied these, or we, we did these work in progress limits. And what happened, ooh, that was too quick. What happens was this, a huge drop from one day to the other. We reduced the things that we were doing at the same time, so we were doing the individual thing way, way faster and much more efficient. Counterintuitive. So we tried it again, right? This could be an accident. The project where I'm still on, this is from last year. So we started last year in winter, and we, had, we, are, we are working for a, one of the old traditional German motor companies. I unfortunately can't tell you which one exactly, but I think there are four, so one of them. Um, and there was the International Automobile Exhibition, and we had to deliver to this date a certain set of features. That was the agreed scope up here. 
And then we were counting our velocity in stories, story stunts. So we don't waste our time estimating how much complexity a story has. We are just looking into approximately sizing the stories in the, in the same way, just some sanity checks. And then we count the stories that we do, because on average, on huge numbers, this will be the same as, as much more exact story um, numbers. And if you look at this, it's not very difficult to tell, judging by the velocity, but it wasn't hard to tell at the time that we won't reach the scope that we wanted to. So on one day, we just said, okay, let's implement the work in progress limits again. They worked so very well last time, let's try them again and see what happens. And from one day to the other, our velocity went up and we achieved much more and could put some scope on top. Just because we did less things at the same time in order to do more things in the long run. A bit counterintuitive, but if you think how you can focus better, can you get better focus on one task at the same time or on three tasks at the same time? So much for the processes. Processes are a bit boring, so I put them in the beginning. When I then look at my wall, I still have my in QA column. I'm still a lonely fighter. I don't want that. I want to work with the other team members. So if I want to move left, I'll move left. I'll join the engineers, as we heard in the previous talk. So let's talk about engineering. And when I come to a new team, like at Metro, um, I went from team to team to team, or now I was for more than a year on a the project, there's one rule that I set when, when I joined the team. And this one rule is to ship every commit. And just so that you can get me right, ship every commit to production. Every single commit. This is my goal. And this is how I achieve a higher quality product. Because there comes a second rule which says, forward only. We don't have rollback strategies. A rollback strategy is a plan B. And you need to train for a plan B. Because otherwise a plan B never works when you need it every other month. So we don't have rollback strategies. We roll forward with bug fixes. As long as we are fast enough, that's not a problem. And when we apply those two rules, we start discussing in the team, and people start to think, okay, wait, if my commit goes out, how can I be sure I, I won't break anything if there's no one there to manually check what I was doing? So obviously, the first thing we do is look into test automation. And I'm lucky enough to work with microservices most of the time, so that makes it a bit easier in handling all the dependencies of what is going on. But this schema is barely how a microservice environment looks like. It usually looks lo more like this, with all kinds of dependencies between all kinds of services. And the first thing that people tend to do is to throw end-to-end -end tests on top of the whole thing to make sure that nothing escapes or no bugs or no problem escape the software that we are building. I always say, don't do that. I argue against it basically every single day. Oh. What's wrong with my, maybe I'm running low on battery. Don't do that. This is what I wanted to tell you. Don't put end-to-end -end tests just on top. They are the most fragile, the longest running, the most difficult to implement, and the hardest to maintain tests, which makes them just the most painful and expensive test that you could possibly put into your application. Why should you do that? What you can do instead is to test every single of those services, every single unit, if you want. It's, it's not unit test as testing single functions in your code. It's testing the single units, the single services. And then you start testing the interaction between the, between the services. We, we just talked about it here, about the dependencies of the services. So you want to have proper contracts between the services to not be too dependent on, on versions or uh, content that other services have. And you want to test this. And we apply consumer-driven contracts for all of these interaction between the services. I won't go into consumer-driven contract testing because I think that can alone fill 20 minutes of a talk. So if you're interested, just talk to me later. This is much, much, much more difficult than the other one. Um, so people tend to just put end-to-end -end tests because it's the easier concept. Just boom, on top, done. You may want to add the thinnest layer of an end-to-end, -end, like a Selenium test, on top of that. But I don't even do this anymore. So I really talk a lot also to other, other QAs on the projects um, that we don't put end-to-end -end functional front-end tests 
on top of the services. Most of the backend, most of the logic lives in the backend. So why should I test edge cases and business logic in the front end? I advocate for nothing but the testing pyramid, which is then half of my job inside the team every day. We have also already talked about feature toggles. And here it becomes much, much more important. If you ship every single commit all the time, not every single commit is a feature on its own. Obviously not. You should commit multiple times a day, not after three weeks. So you need feature toggles because you can't show unfinished things uh, somewhere in your product and you have to get everything ready, everything right, then you can test it properly and then you can ship it. There's another benefit. It's maybe even the bigger benefit. You decouple the risk of a deployment with the risk of a feature release. So a deployment is um, putting a container somewhere, restarting a server somewhere, migrating something on the database. This has all risks. And then when you release a feature, you have a, release, you have a risk of not having thought about edge cases when you enter data. You have a risk of having done caching wrong. There are all kinds of risks there. And if you deploy and deploy and deploy, deploy all the time, all the time, all the time, that risk is gone as soon as you want to release a feature because that was already handled. The deployment is long gone. And then some days later, maybe, when all people are informed, when the product owners are ready, they say, okay, now we can flip the toggle or the feature flag. Does, if anyone knows why they are sometimes called feature flags and toggles, and which one is right, please tell me. I always refer to them as feature toggles because it sounds more intuitive, but I hear more people talking about feature flags. Anyway, at some point, the product owner is ready and says, now we can toggle it on, and then you release only the feature with all, without all the risk of a deployment. And this is then interesting for me, again, from a quality perspective, mitigating risks for releases. And we came across this <laughs> as well, Monitoring is so important. If you don't know what is going on in your application, how do you want to roll forward, roll forward, roll forward? How do you want to know where you have to fix a bug right away? How do you know that you have to react right now? How do you know if something went out that is bad when you don't even see or don't even acknowledge it's being deployed because it's all automatic and every day and every hour and business as usual. So we have a lot of monitoring, we spend a lot of thought, and it's really interesting to have the team or drive a discussion inside the team where everybody's engaged, thinking about what we could measure. We measure the errors, we measure the hits on the database, we measure the response time of our backend services, we measure the load time of our front end, and maybe we want to measure business values. And then the entire team is engaged, thinking about performance, thinking about health of the system, thinking about business value of the system, just because you start talking about monitoring. Is this any good? All of what I've told you. So we've been at Otto. Ah. Otto? Do you know Otto? Can I see a raise of hand? Ah. Most of the people. Cool. Then I won't get into detail there as well. So I, I recently heard, without telling anyone I was there, just some person randomly mentioning that Otto is the German Netflix. I don't know if I want to go that far, but they have by now like 300 plus microservices running very redundant, very reliable system. And I was there somewhere in early 2015. And this, what you see here, is the number of deployments that they did per week across, I don't know, 14, 15 feature teams. And you can see a little kink here that was the first two teams starting with this new microservice. It was a new thing at the time, right? So they were deploying more and more often. Um, and we had a very, very traditional QA department that said we have to test everything and you can't just release. And we ignored them and did it anyway. And in order to check our bag, we, we had a look at the errors that we had. So the customer-facing errors, as they called them, where really things were gone from the website or where we, where we had off-site as a whole product. And we deployed and deployed and deployed, and we, we enabled ourselves to do continuous deployments, all automatic, all the test automatics, no human interaction. And the errors went down the same rate the deployments went up because we were much faster to react on issues. We were much more conscious about what we would commit in the first place. Every commit is valuable, every commit is tested, and we had much less errors. This is from end of 2016, so I, I checked with my friends at Otto and got the latest numbers, and they are now somewhere up at 4,000 deploys 
per week. Um, so this is an insanely well scaling concept, process, and methodology. And I'm not even talking about the tooling here. So you can go to the Otto blog and get all the tooling that they use it for it, and you can use any other tool. It's totally independent of the tool. It's totally independent of your pipeline. It's totally independent of your testing framework. I'm just talking about mindset, culture, and concepts here. Cool. So we got the engineering part covered. We're shipping more features faster, but what do we actually ship? And this is where then can totally dissolve my column where people would park stories for me to do and move to the analysis space. So we have business analysts, we call them business analysts, the people who work in this column because the product owners are most often from our client and um, we don't have product managers per se because we don't follow the Scrum methodology too much. So we just call them business analysts. And then we can work with them and talk about business. So what is quality here very often? Quality is a value to some person, is what Gerard Weinberg said. You could also say quality is value to some important person. Ever had a hippo in your, in your team or a, a meeting where, where it went all down to the opinion of the highest paid person's opinion? Right? Those are the people that sometimes make the call. I don't know why. I don't know what enables them to make a better decision how we can bring value to our users. Just because they get paid more? No. So you can fight against this carefully. You can talk about what is actually value to our users. This may be very different depending on in what part of the world you are, what product you are building, for whom you are building it. Very, very different. Think about what is the actual value that I can bring my users. And then think about how every single commit can have bit and tiny piece of that value. Don't commit if you don't have value and you have to commit. Why should you commit? Why should you run all the tests? Why should you trigger the pipeline if there's no value? That are very, very interesting discussions that you can have then in a pair of developers or working with developers, working amongst yourselves. So in the same way as ops and dev somehow move together, we can also see the QA and the BA moving together and the whole thing getting much, much closer. So we are sitting on the same table, literally. We don't have enough tables for the whole team, so we're just sitting next to each other and really cooperating a lot, communicating a lot, slow, uh, slow, <laughs> uh, very fast feedback cycles. If we ship every hour, what use is a, feed, a feedback cycle of a week or a day in this scenario? So very, very, very close collaboration. That means, we have usually, when our stories are ready to play, we have a very clear scope, we have a clear acceptance criteria, and already considered edge cases there, you know? You don't write some requirements a year ago, you implement them, and then you have the QA looking at all the edge cases. We think about the edge cases from the beginning and make sure which ones we want to have covered and which ones we don't want to have covered because the investment is too high to cover such strange edge cases that we assume won't happen. That means the developers that may pair with the QA again on the same story have a good focus, they know the scope, they really know the scope, they prefer test cases are known by the acceptance criteria, and the edge cases they shall look into are already accounted for, so they don't even have to think about all the edge cases for themselves, it's all there already. And that leads to a happy dev, a happy BA, and a happy QA. Awesome. So. Thinking about quality and delivering higher quality enables us to deliver even faster. That means we see a business advantage of high quality here, and we are currently thinking about this and, and uh, preparing our next talk about the business advantages of quality. So far, we are only talking about preventing loss. The value of, of quality is preventing loss. If you have downtimes, you'll lose money. If your software doesn't work, you'll lose money, you'll lose customers. It's all these scary scenarios, and it's all, there's, there's nothing beneficial to it, or nothing adding. It's just the hygiene stuff that you need to have in place in order to, to get started at all. But I think there's really some advantage here, and I want to look into this in the next years. So stay tuned on next talks. So the last thing, after the business, after we got all this 
set. What else can we do here? We can squeeze this entire thing just a bit more. Why? Because we can? No. Never do something just because you can. This is still the time to market for new features, which is interesting for the BA. And this is the time we need to react to issues and bugs in production, which is very, very dear to me. So I want to get this time as small as possible. And there's something else I can do on a daily basis. I can work with my team and just how I analyze software, and just how I analyze the business case. I can also bid analyze the team without going deep in psychology or something like this. But if you just step away a bit and observe your team, you can, you can do something. One thing for sure is to prevent biases inside your team. I want to just give a few examples. Um, avoid the sunk cost fallacy. You maybe know this feature that you've been working on for the last four weeks, and it almost was done every single day, but there just came some stuff on top, and now it just needs another week, so we should invest another week on this feature just to get it done, because we already invested three weeks. And that's the only argument that is being made. On the other hand, I usually say we already wasted three weeks on a feature where we thought it would take rather one week, so we've overspent three times. Why should we overspend four times just because we already did? It's the same like with a... I'm coming from Berlin. I couldn't fly directly here because we have the same disaster with our airport. It's the same thing, right? Rip it apart and start fresh. Maybe. Challenge your team on that. Then the outcome bias. Very typical for us because... We jump from project to project, usually on a yearly basis. So I always see a new tech stack. I always see a new business domain uh, at a new client. And then people come, especially thought workers, to be honest, saying, but this and that re worked really well on my last project. Spring Boot was awesome last time, so we should use it again. But there is no, often, not always, there is no more reasoning than people liking it and having had a good time with it on the last project in a different business context on a different technology stack with different people, just because something worked at some point of time, don't think it will always work the same ever again. This is why I showed you the effect of the work in progress limit twice to prove it was just not an outcome bias of some lucky case on one project. Overconfidence. People are overconfident. 80% of the drivers think they are over average drivers. So something is obviously wrong. Anyone in the room ever overestimated on what they would deliver in the next two weeks? Uh, a few hands here, sure. The rest never did that, right? So we, we are overly confident in what we want to achieve. And this just doesn't work well in keeping your work in progress limits. If you, if you think we can do that and that and that and that and that, just stop yourself, stop your team, no matter your role. Stop your team and say, focus on fewer things, get them right, and then we can reevaluate all the other things that we could do, but we can only do so much, and it's much less than we usually think short term. I think we, we can achieve much more what, than we think in the long term, like 10 years. But there's the psychology that I don't know. The availability bias, it, it goes a bit hand in hand with the outcome bias. Just because the database available is MongoDB, it doesn't mean unrelational databases are the best use case for you if you have relational data, for example. Don't just use the technologies that we have because they're there. Would you use a map of Vienna here in Linz? No, obviously not. Not just because it's there. It doesn't help you. And the last one, I think, sometimes the most important one, at least for me, is the social proof bias. So this comes from... 20,000 years ago, right? When you were together in your small village and you were going hunting in the woods and then all the people ran away and were scared of something. If you stayed and if you were brave and if you did something else in the group, you were eaten. So that trait of behavior didn't survive evolution. So what we all do, the, the chickens survived, right? We run with a group and if we sit in a meeting where we think about the next stories and all think we should do it exactly this and that way, we tend to agree to it, especially if there's a hippo in the room, right? It's good for your career to agree with a hippo. Try to stay away from that. Try to make your team stay away from that. Challenge your team on it and say, if we all look in this direction, let's just stop for a moment, consider the other direction and make a conscious decision not to go that way, and then we are all set 
to march in this, in this direction. This is what I really, really try to tell my team all the time. Another thing I try to tell them all the time is to not waste a mistake, but to learn from it, right? We, we do mistakes all the time. We just try to mitigate the effects of our mistakes. So what are mistakes that we usually do? And I've, I've brought a chart here. So we have the intentionality of a mistake that we do, and we do mistakes by accident, and we sometimes want to do mistakes on purpose. And there are learning opportunities that only go from high to higher, so there are no low learning opportunities at all. So let's start here. What's here? Sloppy mistakes, typos, uh, some, some, some sloppy things that sometimes happen when, you, when you're focused and you just code away. Some things always happen. We mitigate those, and I promote this very, very much. We, pro we, we prevent those by pairing. Any kind of pairing will do. Ping pong pairing or driver navigator pairing, all of this works. And then there are some higher learning opportunities, which are these, ah, this is how it works. After four hours of trial and error, I finally figured it out. And we usually do this as well in pairs. And in my personal opinion, it really works well if you're a very experienced developer and a very unexperienced developer, because both have usually this aha moment much, much, much more often. If you're very unexperienced, you learn a lot from the very experienced. Ah, this is how you mean it. Ah, this is how you would do it. Ah, this I have never seen it working in this way before. This is what the junior person will say. And then there are three levels of understanding for a senior person. One is to see something and and say, okay, I understood it. The other thing is to see something and do it on your own. And the third level of understanding that most people don't even reach is to tell someone else, to explain it to someone else. And you have to do this in such a pair. And then you will understand anything that you talk about even more. And then you have stretch mistakes. You usually, sometimes you, you enter a range or a business domain or a technology that you do not yet understand. If you want to apply a new technology and you don't know how to do it, that's what I call the stretch mistakes, where you really have to try and you really have to be careful. And we do this in so-called spikes, so we differentiate. If, if we want to try a new technology, for example, a new database technology, for just for the, for the sake of the argument, um, we have a little spike and we say we want to time box it to three days and we have clear criteria of what we want to learn inside this spike. And after two people working on it and trying for three days, they come back to the team and say, okay, we learned all of this, we think the spike is done, and we think we can apply the technology, or we can throw it away and try something else. In any case, what comes out here is only a prototype to be trashed. Right? And then there are the high stakes mistakes. Something just really crazy and dangerous because it's a last minute release. That should ring your alarm bell. Just try to avoid it as much as you can. You, you never always can avoid it, but if you can, just stay away from it. Something that I'm applying all the way here with this pairing and the, the spikes that we do is the safety net that we have. So we are very consequent in test-driven development, another thing that I promote every day, all the day. So we have a lot of tests that help us to um, make these mistakes. And then the last few things about what you can do with your team, what I think is really important. Diversity and inclusiveness. If you don't know the difference, look it up. It's, it's really, diversity is I, in, I invite all kinds of people to my barbecue. Inclusiveness is that I have steak, that I have vegetarian options, that I have gluten-free options, and that I have some vegan options for the people that are coming to my barbecue. So I want to be inclusive. This is again the, our, our metro team, one of our metro teams. There's exactly one white male developer in the team. And it's all devs in the picture, by the way. So this is what I like most. The best team I've worked with was, an, was another team at Metro, where I worked with two educated IT people, one from Brazil, one from the Netherlands, with a former yoga teacher, with a former psychologist. And th those are just the devs. Um, with a former secret service agent, I believe, and all kinds of people. And then we had the other roles on top. And they were so smart in problem solving. If you gave them a problem, they would think about it. They would have so many perspectives on it. 
and they come up maybe with a five-line solution of code for this problem. If you have a homogeneous group of s the same people, and they have less perspectives on this problem, they come up with a solution that is 100 lines of code. And then you want the right skills in your team. What, what does it help you if, you if you have all the people that know about SQL, and in fact, you're only doing front end? That doesn't help you, right? That is a difficult conversation at times, so people hesitate to have it, but it doesn't help the team, it doesn't help the product, it doesn't help your quality, it doesn't help anyone. It doesn't even help the person. So try to get away from this as well. And then last, have fun. And this is so important. So two weeks ago, I brought um, this Überraschungseier, this chocolate eggs, to my team. Every morning in stand-up, when the story moved to done, we all, everybody got chocolate eggs. Two weeks later, everybody is conditioned to bring things to done, and everybody's asking for the chocolate eggs, and, and we run dry, so I have to get new ones now. But this enabled us as well. Imagine I give you 1 million euros now, and you should build an awesome product, whatever it is. And you have the choice between these two teams. Which one do you think will build the better product in the end? I mean, all of them are thought worker and all of them are happy and true, it's just a fake picture, but I think you get my point, right? If you're happy in your job, if you're happy in the team, if you're communicating, you're ultimately trusting more, communicating more, building a better product. So, to summarize, if I have my muffin, my bare, pure, ugly muffin, I want to put some chocolate on top. I want to think about how I can enable engineering to deliver faster and to deliver more reliable. I want to put the cream of knowing my business case, making sure the entire team understands the value that we are trying to deliver, and then I'm ultimately baking quality in, in order to build a high quality software, a high quality product, not just a high quality software. This is the ultimate goal, right? So I say thank you for following this track. And I missed my last slide now with all the important things, the Twitter handle, the blog and everything. Check it out on the, on the left side. Um, if, you have, if you have questions that we won't cover right now, come to me the entire day, please. Ask questions all along. Um, get some inspiration back to me because I constantly want to learn about these things. Thank you.